What's up, wild side besties and baddies? I'm Bailey. And I'm Chelsea. And we're here to walk you through the wild sides. From homicides to hostides and everything in between. We're so glad you're here. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Do it now. Do it good. Read this episode just like we should. <laughs> that, was a, that was a quick edit there. <laughs> quick censorship. Quick censorship. We don't want to get kicked out of Apple Podcasts. I want to first say thank you to our listeners. We got a couple more reviews. They were on Spotify, so you can't like leave names, but we got some more some more numbers and just a shout out to a wonderful fan hillary she sent us a uh, instagram message just being like i literally wait for wednesdays and fridays every week so thank you so hillary thank you for sending us some happiness and it was definitely a shot in the arm for chelsea and me a shot in the arm yeah like a shot in the arm what does that mean like a boost yeah, like a booster, like a shot in the arm. <laughs> I've, ne- I've never. What? I was today years old when I was. <laughs> oh, wowie wow. Wow, wow, wow. Never heard that. All right. Shot in the arm. No, shot in the arm, man. Like a booster shot, I guess. But I can't tell you how excited I am about this case today. I am such a nerd for this case, and I didn't realize how much I love nonviolent crimes. They're pretty great. I am officially converted into nonviolent crimes. I love them. And I love presenting crimes that don't have a lot of like really heavy stuff because I feel like we get to be more like fun and lighthearted in ourselves than having to like be more serious to get through some really heavy stuff you know what i mean yeah bailey has to do a lot less editing of my inappropriate comments yes literally like the last episode we did i was talking about dna analysis for identifying a victim and chelsea was like do you think if there was a zombie apocalypse that we'd have zombie dogs and i was like what and then i'm editing the episode and i was like taking out that whole you know 45 second span and chelsea's like i'm really sad you took out my dog comment i was like right because we were just talking about like an unidentified victim and she was like i didn't say that right then did i and i was like yeah chelsea you did okay to be fair you were saying (laughs) that the canine unit was there trying to find that mildly to moderately decomposing body and that's what made me think of it. I was thinking of the canine unit and I had World War Z on the brain and it just made me think. Yeah. I understand you. I just feel like 89% of the listeners would misinterpret that as being insensitive. Or 89% would be like, that's a really great point. I've thought of that myself. Yeah. Well, I just want to point out that this is episode number 69. And we landed on the moon in 1969. Allegedly. No, we absolutely landed on the moon in 1969. No conspiracy theories about that. (laughs) Oh, your mother would be disappointed in you, Bailey. Oh, we're not going to go there. Did you understand what I said? We landed on the moon in 1969. Yes. You're not going to be like, what does this have to do with anything, Chelsea? Mm, what does this have to do with anything, Bailey? This has to do with a book that was written by a man named, oh, what is his name? Ben Mesrick. Okay. And the title of his book is called Sex on the Moon. Sex on, on the, the moon. moon. Is that like the precursor to Sex on the Beach? Isn't that... Nope. Is it, or what is it? Cake on the Beach? What was that song? I don't know. That Jonas Brothers song. Chelsea, I don't listen to Jonas Brothers, so no. I don't know. It wasn't. It was one of the Jonas Brothers. Thank you. So this episode is, are you ready? 
This is the notorious NASA Moon Rock Heist. The NASA Moon Rock Heist. This makes yeah. me very uncomfortable because we don't have a good history of things happening well for people who still rocks. Like you still in volcanic rock from Hawaii and then Hurricane Katrina hit like right after. So everybody in my family thinks that it's my fault. Well, because then you were told not to. Like it was a curse on you if you took mm. rocks. It was, yeah, for like seven years or something. I don't know. Maybe lifelong. It makes me nervous about these rocks. I just feel like it's going to be very nefarious, very sinister. Yeah, well, this is the notorious NASA moon rock heist. I have never heard of this before in my entire life no. until I ran across the book. And you'll be so proud of me. I ordered the Audible version, listened to some of it, not all of it. Got the juice out of that orange that I needed. And then here we are. Mm hmm and so this all circles around one person who will have some accomplices, but this main person, his name is Thad Roberts. Thad? T-H-A-D? Yes. I think that's the wildest name. I've known a handful of Thads, and I'm assuming that it comes from Thaddeus, but I just think that is the wildest name. Yeah. And so I'm going to start with a background of Thad because I'm going to do some like unofficial deep dives into his psyche as to like why maybe he behaved the way that he did okay okay speculations right it's not diagnosing it's speculating yeah behaviors not people sure right so we are gonna start this story in utah mm -hmm. i think there are rocks in utah actually i don't know but thad roberts was born in 1977 in Utah and grew up on a farm on the outskirts of Syracuse, Utah. He grew up in a very, very Mormon family where Thad viewed his father as a highly religious and fairly brutal man. Yep. When Thad was a freshman in high school, it was there where he met his high school sweetheart who would go on to be his first wife and her name was Katie. The two dated throughout high school, but kept it a secret from their respective families due to the religious beliefs that governed relationships where premarital sex was the ultimate sin. Yes. Was so he would Katie, even... Huh? Was Katie a Mormon as well? Was she a practicing Mormon? Yes. Okay. So it wasn't any like super scandalous, like she was Baptist or something. No, they, they both, from my understanding, they both came from the same religious background. But they were so secretive with their relationship that Thad would even, like, introduce his family to, like, other females to make them think that he was, like, having a normal just, like, friendships with girls and he wasn't tied down to one. So, like, her friends, like, this whole friend group was in on it, right, to keep their relationship secret. All right. But when Thad was 18, he was sent to the mission training center in preparation for his two-year mission trip. Yes. Three days into the process... Thad's guilt about him having sex before marriage began to bubble up. Crippling feelings of unworthiness began to take hold. Mm -hmm. And after three days at the MTC and hearing all of his bunkmates premarital sex confessions, Thad was like, I have to get rid of this crippling guilt and I need to confess. Mm -hmm. So he made an appointment with his mission president and confessed to his sin of premarital sex. Okay. Expecting to get sympathy, Thad was instead met with religious reactivity. Oh. The mission president called together a church quorum that resulted in Thad immediately being kicked out of the mission trip and sent back home to Utah the next day. What? But I thought all of his bunkmates had premarital sex. But they didn't tell the mission president. They didn't do the right thing. They right. just, they did like late night, can't sleep, insomnia confessions with their bunkmates. He decided to go to the president and confess properly. That's why we can't have nothing nice. <laughs> what? Because every time you try to do the right thing, can't have nothing nice. That's why people lie. Uh, right? So they kicked him out, put him on a flight back home to Utah the very next day. When he arrived in Utah, his parents picked him up at the airport and made the silent, totally silent one-hour trip back home. I was going to say, it's like the flight of shame, walk of shame, car ride. 
of shame. Yeah. Oh. And in Ben's book, whenever, because he interviewed Thad about this whole this whole thing, and Thad literally, literally thought his father was going to kill him. Like he was waiting to be like executed for this. Oh so my. he gets home. They make their way to the kitchen. And Thad's father, the first time he opened his mouth and spoke to him, said, two months. They were giving Thad two months before kicking him out of the home. But in the interim, Thad's father made it very clear that Thad was not allowed in his own room, his old room. He was not allowed to touch any of his old possessions. He was not allowed to take any of his old possessions. He could only keep the possessions that were in his duffel bag that he took with him to the mission trip. He was no longer allowed in his room, so he had to sleep in the basement on a cot. While in the house, Thad wasn't allowed to speak or even make eye contact with his siblings. Are you doing okay over there, Chelsea? Why do you do this to me? Why do you? You know how much I hate religious trauma and things of the sort. Why do you do this to me and then expect me to keep my mouth shut? Shame. when I'm bored. Shame. So dad was like, you're not allowed to speak to your siblings. You cannot look at them. You can't make eye contact. So he's he living was, on that island. He's living on that island. And his dad said that he was going to hell and his father wouldn't allow Thad to drag his whole family down with him. Okay. <laughs> Chelsea looked at me and she was like, okay. Thad was instructed to leave the house every morning by 6 a.m. and wasn't allowed to return home until after 10 p.m. His dad was like, I don't care what you do while you're out of the house, but you're allowed to come home after 10 and you're out of the house before 6 a.m. No one will know that you're still here. You're no longer allowed to exist. Okay. Thad had officially been, what, excommunicated from church and family. Ex excommunicado. I knew she was going to say that. That night, his mom came down to the basement and he was like, and it talks about this in the book where, he was like, oh, good. You know, she's going to talk to me. She's going to show me sympathy. And the only thing she said to him was, when you die, are you going to blame how you turned out on me? When his two months were up, Thad moved out of his parents' house, married his high school sweetheart, Katie, and enrolled in the University of Utah. The high school sweetheart, Katie, who he had lost his virginity, like he, who he had, what is it? What am I looking for? Engaged in premarital sex with? Yes. Okay. What? Well, I'm just like, why is everybody freaking out? Like he married the Listen, girl. That, Charles, he married it. Like not didn't... everybody is as religiously progressive as you are. Okay. Thad's out of the house, married his high school sweetheart. So he's what, 18, 19 years old, married and completely living on his own with no sort of lifeline or support from family. Okay. When Thad arrived at the University of Utah, it was the fall of 1995, and it was here where he was struggling with the direction of his life. Right. Um, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. He had been disowned by his family, was on his own, getting a business degree at the time, while falling into debt, trying to support himself and his wife and go to school. He had always loved science and space, and somewhere in his first year of college, an unrelenting determination grasped Thad. And he had this kind of epiphany, and all of a sudden, he was totally determined that he was going to be an astronaut. Okay. Thad told his wife, he told Katie, that he was going to go work for NASA, he was going to become an astronaut, and he was going to be the first man on Mars. Okay. And Katie's like, sure, I support you. Great. So the next two years of his life at university, he is molding himself into the ideal candidate for NASA to achieve his goal. He triple majored in geology, geophysics, and physics. That is wild. He began volunteering at the University of Utah's museum, working in the geology department, cataloging and inventorying rock samples. He routinely, he routinely participated in U of U's anthropology department's excavations doing dinosaur digs. All right. He knew which traits and experiences NASA looked for, so he went on to get his pilot's license and became a certified expert scuba diver. This dude, this dude is wild, right? He doesn't have an off switch. 
there is no off switch with Thad Roberts, and you're going to see that throughout this whole case. Dang. He learned Russian and Japanese and founded the Utah Astronomical Society. Oh, my goodness. Thad Roberts did absolutely everything he could do to be the perfect candidate to achieve his goal. By his junior year, Thad set his sights on the Johnson Space Center program, also known as the JSC Co-op, but the odds were really stacked against him because it was a really coveted slot. So I, my research said it was a job and an internship and a paid internship, so take that as you may. But the individuals typically picked for the JSC program were overachievers, and they weren't just nerds, but they were like whole well-rounded packages. Yeah. Competing from all over probably the world, but definitely the United States. Only about 6% of applicants are accepted from schools for the program. And a lot of them are from like Texas A&M, University of Texas. Most of the candidates accepted are engineering majors, which Thad was not. Mm -hmm. So he definitely had the what? A disadvantage. A disadvantage there. He was also considerably older than most college sophomores comparatively speaking well yeah because he had that stint where even though it wasn't very long i'm sure that stint of going into trying to go into the mission field and all of that and then coming home and then he did business school for a little bit yeah like i right yeah, that makes sense and he was also married right so he was kind of in a different category than a lot of the applicants for this for this jsc program mm -hmm. But it was literally his best and only avenue to becoming an astronaut. There was no other way to get to the top without going through a really prestigious position like this. For nearly three months, Thad emailed or called the JSC co-op department every day asking for an interview. Okay. Then one day, he's cataloging rocks in the basement of UNU. He receives an email from Bob Musgrove, who is the director of the JSC co-op program to schedule a phone interview. Oh, don't you know he was so excited? He was so excited. And he was just like, I've got one shot. And he did. He had one shot to do this. With Thad's interest in physics, geology, and anthropology, and years of fossil hunting experience, Thad had the makings of a planetary geologist. But what really sold NASA on Thad Roberts was his enthusiasm. They found that he was so well-rounded, he ran the university's observatory, which was kind of in faltering condition, and he, like, got it together, got people involved, spiffed it all up, volunteered at the, like I said, the Utah Museum of Natural History in Salt Lake City, and he and his wife, Katie, did a volunteer fundraiser for cystic fibrosis through Salt Lake City, where they uh, bicycled from Salt Lake City to San Francisco, raising about $10,000. I can't. I don't even like they are aliens. That's what the end of the story is. And they are actually <laughs> like he was the first man on Mars because he's from Mars because he is an alien and or he was a regular person. And then the moon rock business, it was kind of like Spider-Man where he got his hands on like infected rocks. And so NASA was like, this is the type of dude we're looking for. And when Bob Musgrove called Thad, he said, I've already made up my mind. We think you'd be a great addition to the JSC co-op program. And against all odds, Thad Roberts was accepted into the highly competitive, highly prestigious program at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, in the fall of 2000. Dang. Isn't this crazy? Go, Thad, go. So when he got this offer... It was decided between him and Katie that she would hang back in Utah and he would go to Houston for the internship because he was still enrolled at the U of U. And so whenever he would finish a round of internship, like they had phases and, and rounds. And so when he'd finish one round, he'd come back to U and U and continue his, his degree in his program. Right. So it was still he was still in college doing this internship. Mm -hmm. He began his internship in astrophysics before moving on to geo astrophysics. He worked as a flight lead for the Neutral Buoyancy labor Laboratory, or laboratory. I always think of Dexter's laboratory when he says laboratory, so I always read it that way. <laughs> and he put his training and certifications to use. He had a role as a support diver 
helping space-suited astronauts practice their tasks in 40-foot deep pools. Okay. So he assisted with training dives alongside astronauts in underwater mock-ups. And while he was at NASA, this is where Thad was introduced to the lunar vault, where NASA kept material from the Apollo missions within a secure lab, and it was billions of dollars worth of rocks, essentially. So it's like the NASA version of the end of Indiana Jones, when it's just all those crates of, like, things that the government has, like, collected throughout the years, like the Ark and yeah. things in there. It's kind of like the NASA version of that. This is the Fort Knox of lunar particles. Okay. Which I never... It makes sense, NASA, that you would have a lab for that. But I i don't think there's been a situation in my life that's made me think in that direction. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of a simultaneously like, what? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it <laughs> blows my mind. Back in 1969, in the early 1970s, the world watched with wonder as Apollo astronauts collected rock samples from the lunar surface. These precious items, along with a piece of meteorite that could hold signs of life on Mars, were all sealed to prevent contamination with the Earth's atmosphere, and they were ultimately stored in a safe at the Johnson Space Center lab in Houston. Okay. The moon rocks, again collected during the Apollo missions, held enormous scientific value. Not only were they physically priceless, but they represented monumental achievements in human history, right? Like, we went to space, we collected these things, we're doing all of this research on it. Wild stuff that I never gave second thought to. Yeah. In total, NASA had collected, since then, about 842 pounds of lunar material, making each sample invaluable for our ongoing research. Except it wasn't the safe in the lunar lab that Thad began to focus on. It was a safe of similarly, quote, used samples that he discovered that was in the lab of one of his idols at NASA, and that was Dr. Everett Gibson. Okay. And from kind of immersing myself into this NASA world, Dr. Everett Gibson is like the goat when it comes to lunar particles and rock research. He's the alpha. He's the alpha. And everybody else are betas. That's right. That's right. So these used samples had been experimented on or used for teaching at colleges and schools, but they were kind of considered by NASA as trash and invaluable because they were contaminated, right? So you couldn't do a whole lot with them. As Kate, would, Kate says it all the time, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That is the actual motto of this episode. Okay. Okay. <laughs> These used samples, again, were considered kind of trash by NASA, but they were still valuable. And the next few days, Kick started what would turn into nothing short of an obsession for Thad Roberts that this trash, quote unquote, could change someone's life if one could only figure out a way to get it out of the lab. Yeah. So even though they were, you know, trash to NASA, they would still be invaluable to a number of collectors in the world. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Question mark. <laughs> Thad notices, like many of the rocks and fossils at U of U, that there are all these moon rocks in a safe and not being used and appreciated and being thrown in a corner. What a waste. Nobody puts those moon rocks in a corner. Nobody puts moon rocks in the corner. He begins to think that the right thing to do is to take these moon rocks out of NASA and use them. He had done the same thing while working at the University of Utah Museum. He started stealing fossils, literally stuffing them in his pockets, walking out of the museum. And he would go to parties and flaunt them and show them like literally there was like a T-Rex like nail fossil, a talon, I guess. And he was just like, it's a waste. There's all of this, you know, all of these wonderful, beautiful things that are sitting in a box and somebody deems them as trash, and this is unacceptable. Dad Roberts decided that this was unacceptable. So he was going to do something about it, and his brain started to weave a really impulsive and risky web. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, in the, in the like, southern 
Christian culture circles, we call that in the book of Thad. So like when you have yeah. an opinion, right? It's like in the book of Thad. In the book of Thad, he was correct. And these beautiful things are not trash. And he's going to change lives with it. He is going to Florence Nightingale the heck out of those rocks. Uh-huh. Fortunately slash unfortunately, by the spring of 2002, so it's been almost two years, Thad's personal life began to crumble. Despite Katie's support in his decision to train at the Johnson Space Center, she didn't want to uproot her life in Salt Lake City. The two kind of grew apart. They grew estranged. And this was the perfect excuse to justify Thad being impulsive and having this burning desire to be the brightest star in the solar system of the JSC's social circles. <laughs> so here's this Mormon boy, man now, but grew up in a really hyper-religious, very conservative, very strict, very sheltered lifestyle. <laughs> he gets to the most prestigious place with beautiful humans, with beautiful minds, and apparently it was this, they had really active social lives because they're really responsible, work hard, play hard, I guess. Yeah. And so Thad, he was very shy. He was all of these things, but he got to JSC and started hanging out in these social circles. And he, I mean, it was almost like an addiction for him. He mm -hmm. learned real quickly. It broke him out of his shell. He loved the attention it got him. And it just started a really big domino effect for him. Thad is going hashtag but wild. He is. He is. One night, a group of interns took a ferry to Galveston Island, and it was here where Thad would be hooked by infatuation a second time. The first time was with the moon rocks. The second time was with... Cocaine. <laughs> no. The second time was with a biology graduate from Texas Lutheran University by the name of Tiffany Brooke Fowler. That was my second guess. <laughs> yeah. Thad and Tiffany connected, and it was a tale as old as time. <laughs> he was immediately taken by blonde hair, blue-eyed beauty. The night they met, they talked for 14 hours straight before hooking up and Thad moving into her apartment. Okay. All right, Thad. Yeah. Thad with his wife, Katie, back in Utah. Oh. Right? So even though he was still married to Katie, he was in a love-induced tie and wanted to give Tiffany the moon. Or the moon rocks. <laughs> so I I just wanted to add this in here because I'm way too much of a nerd to let it to let it slide. But I actually learned something new recently, and maybe I should be ashamed that I didn't know this. But the scientific name for honeymoon phase is called limerence. I think I know this. This sounds strangely familiar. Okay. I feel like this is something I absolutely should have known, but I didn't. But limerence is essentially when there is a flood of chemicals over a prolonged period of time, and it creates obsessive thoughts, feelings, behaviors, usually an emotional dependence on another person. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, science is, it's shown that whenever we get like really, what, hooked on somebody, love at first sight, lust, whatever, mm -hmm. there's like crazy levels of dopamine and oxytocin that are flowing in the brain. Mm -hmm. But I also learned that we also release high levels of cortisol. So falling in love is super stressful on the body, which I didn't know. I did not know that either. Mm -hmm. But I say all of this to say is that the honeymoon phase literally is almost, it almost does the same thing to the brain that cocaine does. So I kind of was right. Yeah. Tiffany cocaine. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. He meets Tiffany and he is just awestruck he's love struck he's just infatuated he's obsessed he's twitter pated he's twitter pated he's got all this passion for his new girlfriend and he kind of starts to remember all of the jokes his co-workers at the space center would make about selling moon rocks to fund projects and he began to think could i actually pull this off and according to him in his interview in the book he was like it wasn't really a serious thought until he said it out loud to Tiffany, and she says, wow, that sounds so romantic. Oh, Tiffany. And hearing this sealed the deal for Thad. Tiffany. He no longer was thinking if he could, 
but he was now absolutely cemented into the idea that he absolutely should. I think we need to take a pause and talk about what's wrong with Tiffany thinking that illegal activity is romantic. I'm so glad you said that because I literally wrote another nerd paragraph right here. And falling in love affects intellectual areas of the brain and triggers the same sensation and euphoria experienced by people when they take cocaine. And it's not just part of the brain that is like the happy vibe, vibe feedback part. Mm -hmm. But it's, it also affects the core system that drives motivation. Mm. So activity in the circuits prompt people to take action. It makes things attractive and literally increases, quote, motivational salience. Okay. Simply put, it makes you want things and it makes you want people. So this whole concept of love at first sight, limerence, love addiction, maybe if you want to call it the honeymoon phase, all at the kind of at this point interchangeable words it makes you feel really motivated full of drive and itching to take action okay the world is full of opportunities and it's more excitement than hesitation of the threats of your behavior you get what i'm saying yeah actually yeah i can i think i have some firsthand experiences yeah so before everybody gets all swoony and they're like oh my god how romantic is this before Thad was so obsessed with Tiffany, his attraction to the Moon Rocks happened before her, mm -hmm. and it was also driven by a desire for financial gain. Sure. Yeah. Thad, again, by this time, he was falling hard for this, this person, had some financial problems, and really quickly after meeting Tiffany, Katie finds out about the relationship, and they get formally separated. Okay. Thad now had the idea, and he believed that stealing and selling the moon rocks on the black market could solve his financial problems. Okay. His intent was to sell the rocks to private collectors or museums through underground channels. Okay. Yes. So that, that way it's still like bona fide criminal activity. Like he's not just going to sell it to like some dude you know, on the street. Yeah. Some millionaire up in Montana that just wants to have them. Like he's going to do something righteous with them. Put them in a I place don't, where they belong. You no, know, I don't think so. It was literally just selling them to the highest bidder. I'm just saying, I bet you he had a process in his mind that was like, oh, not only am I going to sell it to the highest bidder, but I'm going to make sure that it goes. It sounds like there's a lot of control in this mm -hmm. environment. So now that he had the, the plan, I don't know if plan's the right word yet, but the idea, the motivation, the motive. The brainstorming phase. The brainstorming phase. He starts researching how he could actually steal the lunar samples locked away in Building 31 in. And this is where NASA, NASA's Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science, so ARIES, the ARIES lab is at the Johnson Space Center. Mm -hmm. And with it being 2000, he also had Ask Jeeves. The search engine. Oh, I totally forgot about that. I remember asked. Yeah, I too. He had that on his side as well. Take that chat GPT. Yeah. The problem. There are lots of problems with this idea, okay? Yeah. But the first problem was that Building 31N was one of the five buildings on NASA's Houston campus that his level two clearance badge wouldn't work. Mm, yeah. He knew that he needed some help. <laughs> To execute this heist, he recruited his love-struck girlfriend, Tiffany Fowler, and another intern named Shay Sauer. So Tiffany at the time was 22. She was an intern at NASA's Tissue Culture Lab Laboratory, and Shay was only 19, and she was an intern that worked in the zero-gravity pollination experiment for NASA. How are these 19-year-olds getting... And Listen, and these are the brightest. I mean, this is like ugh, these people are so wicked smart and so motivated. You know what I mean? And it just blows my mind that they're sitting around me like, yeah, yeah, let's steal some moon rocks, you guys. Like, you have so much coming down the pike for you professionally doing this, these yeah. internships. But I mean, your frontal cortex isn't quite developed either. So there's a little bit of that. <sighs> yeah. And so he told them about the plan, and they were like, hell yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> and they began planning 
I'm nice. sure I'm sure he was like, I mean, you're gonna get a cut of it. Like I already have museums, you know, that I'm thinking of. Like I'm sure he presented it really well. Yeah. Tom Cruise is gonna make a movie about it in a couple of years. I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. So in the spring of that year, 2002, Thad is back at the University of Utah, again, because he bounces back and forth. And he shared these thoughts about stealing the moon rocks with a friend of his by the name of Gordon McWhorter. Okay. And the only problem was, the only problem with this plan was that it's illegal for anyone but the federal government to possess lunar material. Okay. Yeah. Right? Like, you you can't own anything from the moon or Mars or asteroids or anything like that. It's illegal. Not if they fall into my backyard. My husband was going to hear you. <laughs> I dare you to come and get my moon rock from my backyard. And mine is my property. Right. My property. Don't tread on me. And Thad had no idea how to go about doing anything illegal like black market shit so he asked gordon for help and gordon was like so he asked the one guy who he knew who smoked cigarettes and he was like i bet that dude yeah he like smoked a lot of weed and was <laughs> always like had these get rich quick schemes right right even in the mormon circles there's always that one dude that smokes cigarettes yeah right oh man and so he was just like i don't know how to do this and gordon mcwarder was like that's crazy but then he started to get curious about, could it work? And was there actually a way to sell them once they had them? If, miraculously, they pulled this heist off. Okay. So Gordon went to a website for mineral collectors where he made a form letter titled, Anyone interested in private bid on Moonrock, please email me back. This is giving, <laughs> this is giving <laughs> cannibal of <laughs> Rotenberg, Rotenberg yeah. vibes. Like, finding some shady chat room 2000 Listen. mcwarder so gordon sent the emails from the university of utah library using a fictitious address later he forwarded all of these replies to thad and the two men then created an email address for an orb robinson which was a play on singer roy orbison <laughs> So they created a woman walking down the street. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, Orb Robinson. And eventually Gordon put them up for sale on a website for the Mineralogy Club of Antwerp, Belgium. Okay. And the listing read, genuine moon rocks going for anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 a gram. I was about to say, like, what? I mean, I know that it was in the 2000s, but that's pretty cheap. But no, when you say a, a gram. gram. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think there's like six grams of sugar in a sugar packet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of puts into perspective for you. Oh, yeah. I have literal no brain capacity and ability to understand grams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, weights and measurements i my brain just stops working i don't know how to do that yeah and it was no surprise that a potential buyer popped up real quick and someone there was an article i read that they said there's a kind of fever that comes over some people about like moon rocks because it's considered a quote ultimate collectible i mean right right there's no moon rocks available. So if you come across one, it's like the ultimate collectible for people. And on May 7th of that year, 2002, a man by the name of Axel Immerman, he was a Belgian amateur mineralogist. He received an email from Orb Robinson. And so Axel replied. So Axel Immerman, and he was a Belgian what? Amateur mineralogist. Okay. He received this email, and he replied that he would definitely, possibly be interested in the offer if the price was right, and but only if the samples could be authenticated, mm -hmm. which is fair. Mm -hmm. They went back and forth about the authentication, sample size, and price before Orb finally offered $300 a gram for a kilo-sized moon rock. The catch here, however is that Axel Immerman, this Belgian dude, became suspicious of the sale and mid-negotiations contacted the FBI. 
the American FBI. And he was like, hey, y'all, I just want you to know that I got offered this offer for Moon Rocks. This seems sus. This seems sus. And you boys need to jump on this. And the FBI was like, bet. So FBI agents, what? I just can't handle this teeter-tottering of conscience. Like, that's what's so weird to me. Like, I will definitely buy Moon Rocks from you off of the black market. However, I'm also going to turn you into the FBI. Like, this is, this is it's wild. not the black, they weren't on the black market. Uh, they were on a, like a mineral cell website, like okay. a normal. And so it, I think from my understanding, it was one of those things like Axel must have assumed that they were previous owners of like Moon Rocks. Mm -hmm. And so our, they had decided to sell their share of it. So it wasn't necessarily, I guess, illegal. Right. But then whenever the negotiations, they were going back and forth, Axel was like, ah, this, like, I'm pretty sure, like, this is stolen government shit and they're trying to sell it to me kind of stuff, right? Like every truck that Lucas has tried to buy off of the <laughs> list. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the FBI is like, bet. They had Immerman email Orb Robinson and be like, yes, I'm interested in buying your lunar treasures, right? Now, FBI agents were initially convinced that it was an internet scam to scam Homeboy out of money. But what they found out is they traced the emails and determined that some of them came from the Johnson Space Center. <laughs> and so Special Agent Lawrence Wolftenhan was quoted as saying, my God, they might actually have access to these things, which turned the, we think this is a prank into, oh shit, this just turned turned things up a notch. It's, it's getting real up in her. The Belgian collector, Axel Immerman, responded in his email, which by the way, is really the FBI responding, <laughs> right? They respond to Orb and they're like, hey, absolutely, I'm here to buy it, but I can't come to the United States until September. So my brother, Kurt, and my sister-in-law, Lynn, who is also a mineral collector, they're going to meet up with you to verify the rock's authenticity to complete the deal. We'll meet up with you in the parking lot of the old Kmart. <laughs> yeah. In the parking lot of the, the Circle K right outside of NASA's Johnson Space Center. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, yeah. We're going to meet up. You're going to meet up with Kurt, my sister-in-law, Lynn. And I've already wired Lynn $100,000. And so Orb, a.k.a. Thad and Gordon, were just like, okay, yep, this is great. And so they all set up a meeting for July of that year in Orlando, Florida, not far from Orb's hometown of tampa oh my gosh this is like the scene from wayne's world where they're like we got five thousand dollars we got five thousand dollars <laughs> yeah oh and i think hopefully you guys are tracking but the belgian collectors american relatives were really undercover fbi agents yeah and Thad was screwed before he even followed through with the heist, and he had no idea. Oh, no, gosh. Poor Thad. Sad Thad. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad, bad Thad. Bad Thad. Now with the buyer in hand, Thad, Tiffany, Gordon, and Shake now put their plans in action when Thad went back to his internship in Houston. A couple months later, on a balmy night, on July 13th, 2002, a Jeep Cherokee drove up to an entrance at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The guard took a casual look at the car, questioned Thad and said, hey, you get a new car? And Thad said, no, sir, borrowed it to help a friend move. And they were like, Good job, Thad. Awesome sauce. And they smiled, nodded, waved the three NASA interns through the gate. Yeah. They drove through the rocket park, past the 363-foot-long Saturn V moon rocket, 
and parked near the entrance of Building 31 Inn. They watched for passing cars, prying eyes, but it was clear. They started the first steps of their heist. Now, I just want to say, this was incredibly difficult to pull off. Like, almost impossible to pull off. That's what makes this story, I think, so wild. So when they got there, they parked. Thad and Tiffany were going to go in. They were going to do the thieving, <laughs> the stealing. Shay was going to be the lookout. The three of them, they had been studying the building for weeks. They knew when the co-workers typically, typically came and left at night, when they arrived, and when no one was in the building. So they had, they had this planned out. Next, they figured out how to rewire the security cameras of the building. Okay. We don't really know how, but these are genius level people. Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves, yeah. <laughs> and so as a result, they could enter the building. Thad and Tiffany could enter the building while Shay stayed and monitored the cameras from the car. Third, they got access to the building by having a former co-worker email them the code. Okay. Okay. They got friends in low places. Yeah. They breached the building. They strode down the hallway, heading to where the safe was kept. Problem was, the vault that held the rocks was in a, like a no oxygen, how would you say that? There, like, you couldn't breathe in that room because it was in an airtight, what, oh, space? Like simulate the atmosphere of the moon? Yeah, so they, did, they wouldn't have contamination and stuff like that. So Thad and Tiffany put on neoprene suits and breathing apparatuses. I was just going to say they put on that scuba gear. Mm -hmm. Because the vault with the rocks had no oxygen to protect the moon rocks, right? So once they made entry into that, what, that lab space, they would only have 15 minutes of oxygen supply while they were in the room before they would literally suffocate and die. Okay. okay. But before they got to the, to the lab, the Aries lab, there was a electronic cipher lock that you had to put like a special secret code in. Okay. Somehow... They figured out how to crack the code. Of course they did. Nobody really knows how, but somehow these two brilliant interns figured out how to crack this code. So when they made entrance into the room, they arrived at the rocks themselves, which were locked in a safe. Thad and Tiffany couldn't figure out how to crack the safe, and they were running out of oxygen. So they decided to take the entire 600-pound safe with them. Are they bodybuilders as well as brilliant geoscientists, geophysicists? They brought a dolly that they purchased at Walmart the, the night before. Uh-huh. So this dude, right, who, by the way, is breaking into a lab that was run by his mentor, prominent mm. astrobiologist Everett Gibson at NASA. Mm -hmm. Now he's breaking into his laboratory to steal from him. Mm -hmm. They were like, we can't take, we can't figure out how to crack this. So they brought their dolly in and wheeled it out. Locking the door behind them, threw up the lift gate to the Jeep, and somehow got an 800-pound safe into the back of the Jeep. I guess they are on like adrenaline, and they're yeah. Just... I mean, it's got to be. They've they figured out how to rewire security systems. They got past a security code that nobody has the code to, except you know, Doctor Gibson. They figured out how to crack that. They had neoprene suits and breathing apparatuses to steal these this the safe. Isn't this the craziest shit? I yes. Yep. So they, they throw the safe, the whole 600-pound safe, into the back of the Jeep, closed it, got in, and, and started to drive away. Even though the Jeep was weighed down, right, and driving almost at an angle, 
and the speed limit in on the roads that they were on were was five miles an hour and so they had to drive five miles an hour across this entire compound went through security checks with a 600 pound safe in the back of the jeep were not stopped were not searched and left the compound i mean yeah i i mean i would be like hey y'all have a nice night you know i would have just been like what's up what's up shay what's up tiffany what y'all doing y'all moving a couch y'all got a couch back there all right all right y'all be fun y'all be good they drove to a nearby motel brought the safe in couldn't crack it so they went to a store bought a power saw cut it open and despite all of the noise of cutting through a safe with a power saw in a hotel no one came on knocking on the door there were no complaints when they opened the safe they were blown away by what they found Inside were rocks brought back from astronauts from every Apollo mission that had landed on the moon and a Martian meteorite valued by federal officials at about $21 million. There were also all items contaminated. It's all contaminated by that Motel 6 air. There were also other items that were completely irreplaceable to scientific research. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So they've pulled it off. They've pulled off hijacking almost $30 million of invaluable, priceless objects from literally from whole ass NASA. So they have the safe. Now they got to sell it. They had their guy, right? Axel Emmerman. So Thad emailed Gordon and they emailed Axel and they scheduled, they confirmed their meet in Orlando. Shea Sauer stayed back in Houston. Thad and Tiffany loaded a tackle box full of moon rocks into her car, left Houston, driving through the night to Orlando, Florida. On July 20th, 2002, which ironically was the 33rd anniversary of Neil Armstrong's walk on the moon. Oh. Thad and Tiffany, after driving all night in Houston, they arrived in Orlando. They checked into a hotel where they had to wait before the scheduled meet was to go down. And so what does the couple decide to do? Thad gets the moon rocks, puts them under the blanket, and the two proceed to have sex on the moon rocks. (laughs) You ever get kinky with those things? So Thad literally now had the bragging right as being the only dude to technically have sex on the moon. Oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. I see what you did there. Did you make that up yourself? (laughs) Bailey? No, because the name of the dude's book is Sex on the Moon. Oh, that's right. Oh, heavens. So they have sex on these moon rocks and just have contaminated in so many ways invaluable scientific evidence for research. Oh, <laughs> and this is why the debate still stands of what is the definition of knowledge right like how can somebody be so smart and so dumb all in the same breath so they get to the hotel they throw the rocks on the bed screw on the rocks and then by that time they wrap it up whatever that looks like and it's time to meet the buyers they drive to Italiani's restaurant on, on Orlando's International Drive. When they get there, Gordon and Tiffany sat in a corner of the restaurant while Thad waited at another table for Lynn, remember the sister-in-law. Right, right. While the trio communicated <laughs> with walkie-talkies to each other. Uh. Lynn shows up, walks in, and this is actually... FBI agent Lynn Billings walks in and asks for Orb. She and Thad talk, become acquainted, and then Lynn's husband, Kurt, who is FBI special agent Lawrence Wolfenden, he arrives, join Lynn and Thad at the table. When Kurt gets there, Gordon and Tiffany join in, and now the four of them 
are sitting around eating dinner discussing the deal of a lifetime. Everybody in the restaurant, unbeknownst to Thad, Tiffany, and Gordon, literally every person in the restaurant was an FBI agent. Okay, this is like Miss Congeniality at the very beginning when she's, right? Yes. They're all sitting in that restaurant. Yes. So they finish dinner. And they're like, let's take this to a place where we can actually, you know, trade. Mm. Trade our funds in the rocks, right? Mm-hmm. Thad gets into Lynn's Jaguar. They drive to the Sheraton Hotel. Tiffany, Gordon are following. When they arrive at the Sheraton, as the trio stepped out of their vehicles... 40 FBI agents (laughs) swarm yeah swarm like every sting operation in every Hollywood movie you've ever seen oh god get on the ground hands on the ground dad Tiffany Gordon are arrested handcuffed and had to sit and wait for hours while the FBI the FBI obtained a search warrant Thad was quoted as saying, I felt my soul drain out of my body. (laughs) (laughs) Nearby busy highways were shut down during the sting and the arrest to prevent escape. Oh my gosh. The FBI gets a search warrant. The lunar rocks, along with other stolen materials, were quickly recovered by the FBI. And this is the really sad part. And it is sad for me as, as... I wouldn't consider myself a scientist, but a scientist lover, I guess. I don't know how to say that. But the samples were recklessly handled. Of course, some of them being laid out on the bed. They were wrapped in socks or mixed with ordinary minerals. And because of this, there was significant damage to their scientific value, right? Sure. According to the FBI's website, the moon rocks were contaminated to the point of being rendered completely useless to the scientific community. And three decades of handwritten notes by NASA scientists were destroyed. How were they destroyed? I don't know the details of that. Oh, that's... 30 30 years of handwritten notes were destroyed. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Among the samples stolen was the the famous meteorite ALH84001 that contained fossilized evidence of microbiotic life on Mars, so it was proof that there was possibly the potential for life on Mars. Also stolen was a set of notebooks describing in minute detail, or minute detail, I don't know, in detail the samples brought back by the Apollo moonwalkers between 1967 and 1972. These were the life's work, the life's work of Dr. Everett Gibson, the scientist in whose custody the moon rocks rested. Dr. Gibson was planning on um, writing a book on his research, but was forced to put on hold because he lost his data. That's awful. Isn't that terrible? That's just awful. And seriously, what a waste. So people were pissed, naturally. Well, yeah. Right? Once they were arrested, Thad and his accomplices faced really serious charges. Shay was arrested in Houston. She, Thad, and Tiffany immediately confessed and implicated one another. Gordon McWhorter was less forthcoming. The charges against the four of them included conspiracy to steal, transport, and sell government property. When the FBI searched Thad's Salt Lake City apartment for more moon rocks, they found fossils that he had taken from the Utah Museum of Natural History, which resulted in additional charge. Tiffany, Shay, and Gordon made bail, began to prepare for their legal proceedings, but Thad, who was unable to pay for his, spent 16 months in in a Florida jail awaiting his trial and sentencing. In October of 2002, Thad Roberts pled guilty to stealing moon rocks from various Apollo missions valued at the time between two and a half and seven million dollars, not including some of the other things, Mm -hmm. while he was working as an intern at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. He also admitted to stealing dinosaur bones and fossils from the Natural History Museum in Salt Lake City, where he was attending the U of U. Obviously, Thad's crime, 
I think was driven not only by like financial desperation, but personal ambition and a need for recognition. Because mm-hmm. he kind of had this, he loved to be the center of attention. He wanted to be the first and the best in everything. Mm-hmm. So initially it was like he wanted to impress his girlfriend, which I want you to understand that by the time he sold or uh, stole these rocks, they had literally only known each other for like weeks. This is like Bonnie and Clyde. Uh huh. So, I mean, I don't want to sound some type of way, but he got excommunicated from his Mormon church for a female and literally broke into NASA and stole invaluable scientific research for a female that he'd only known for a couple weeks. There's a lot to unpack in that box. Hmm. You think you think that was the the central driving point? I don't know. Speculation. I mean, it could be a thousand different things, right? Thad Roberts was convicted on several counts, including theft of government property and interstate transportation of stolen goods. Judge Ann C. Conway called Thad a master manipulator and doubled the sentencing guideline of 46 to 57 months, sentencing him to eight years and four months in federal prison. Oh, So she was pissed. Yeah, she dropped the gavel. Tiffany Fowler and Shea Sauer also faced charges, though their sentences were less severe. They were given leniency for cooperation, so they were only given six months of house arrest and three years of probation. With their felony convictions, neither can become an astronaut. Now, I don't know if this is the saddest part to me. There's a lot of sad parts in this, but Gordon McWhorter arguably was the most unlucky of them all Mm. he was urged to make a plea and he refused because he was just like i just used the internet for for a couple of hours like i didn't steal them i didn't transport he didn't transport them he met them in orlando he was like i'm not a terrorist like i'm just a college kid who got caught up in a glorified fraternity prank and i don't think he's super wrong but he ended up getting six years in prison yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. He kind of was an accomplice to this stuff. But Shay and Tiffany, who literally stole it, got six months of house oh, arrest and three yeah, years of probation. True. That's true. Yeah, when you're when you're comparing it to their sentence, yeah. But it reminds me, I don't remember what movie I just watched, but it was something like somebody's got to go to prison. Somebody's got to take the fall of it. Maybe it was National Treasure. Uh, uh-huh. when they enter where they end up arresting ian instead of nicholas gage he was like somebody's got to go to prison right you know what i'm fascinated with is your obsession with that movie <laughs> does that come up a lot i don't know <laughs> talk about it a whole lot i don't even realize it i just think it's a great movie feds came down real hard on gordon mcwarder They had a parade of witnesses, FBI agents, former astronaut Harrison Schmidt, NASA lunar sample curator Gary Lofgren, NASA cost analyst Kelly Sire, email verification experts. Everybody's testifying against Gordon. Unfortunately, his attorney didn't call any witnesses, put him on the stand. He was convicted and sentenced to five years and 10 months at the Federal Correctional Institution in Florence, Colorado. Hey, I know where that is. I used to work there. Not at mm-hmm. the, not at the prison, but I used to work in that town. Yeah. And there was a gentleman who did an interview with Thad. So Thad's been released. He's a TEDx speaker. He's like written a book. Like he obviously didn't become an astronaut. And this this dude interviewing him, his Raka, he said, but this is for someone you'd only known for three weeks. And Thad said, yeah, but I don't think that kind of connection that people really desire requires much time. And Rocco was like, okay, but three weeks to do something this dramatic? And Thad was, he said that him and Tiffany planned on making a life together. He said, in my own head, stealing something wasn't the way I looked at it. We weren't going to take this money we were getting from it to go buy a yacht or lots of cars or a big house. We were going to live just the small kind of lifestyle but fun science that might change the world, you know? And then he sighed and he said, I mean, the simple answer is to say that I did it for love. I did it because I wanted to be loved. I wanted someone to know that I really cared about them that much. 
and to have the symbol there to remind them of it. He said he served his time, he's moved on from the experience, and after hating himself for two years, Robert said he either had to forgive himself or kill himself. So, c'est la vie, he forgave himself, and he currently is doing his thing. He's into extreme outdoor sports. There's no surprise there because this is Thad always on Roberts. Mm -hmm. And he's doing, you know, like skydiving, rock climbing, all of these super extreme things because he's addicted to it. He's an adrenaline junkie, mm -hmm. right? And that is the NASA moon rock heist that remains one of the most bizarre and infamous thefts in modern history. That is so bizarre. I really don't know why there's not a movie about this. Listen, like I, I truly do not understand why either Matt Damon or Tom Cruise <laughs> not made or Leo or Leo has made a movie about this. Catch me if you can type of thing. Uh, it wouldn't be Tom Cruise because there's no run in in it. Tom Cruise runs in every movie and there's oh. no running in this, right? He could he could find he could find a way to do it. He could find a way to run. So a couple of maybe positive things. Number one, although Thad's and Tiffany and Shay's and Gordon's actions damaged the scientific community by contaminating stolen lunar samples, it also led to significantly tighter security measures at NASA and other research facilities. Yeah, but right? it probably created jobs. Uh, today, moon rocks and other space artifacts are guarded with much greater vigilance, ensuring that such a heist is unlikely to ever occur again. And, you know, one of the things that I forgot to put in here, but what's crazy is I think it was like Thad's first week at the internship and he was hanging out at this pool party, you know, with these people and he's trying to impress everyone. And he said, you know, every week we should see who did the coolest thing at their job. And he was like, I'm going to get close to the, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was a sp essentially a space shuttle, mm. right? Or a simulator for it that literally astronauts and that's it had access to. Mm -hmm. His first week there, homeboy, not only makes it in by just like, oh, I'm here to see the the simulation. And people were like, oh, come on back. Like, they didn't question him. He just put on his confidence. He walked in and he got to like participate in it, which never happens. And he had been at NASA for a week. So this guy just had like, I think the thing that blows my mind is if he had put all of this talent and motivation and energy into being the greatest, he probably would be the first man on Mars. You know what I mean? But instead, he stole some rocks, had sex on it for a chick that they never talked to each other again after the trial. Oh. Right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. To me, it's kind of what you're always saying where it's like, don't kid yourself. You don't wake up one morning and you're just like, I'm going to commit a kidnapping or a murder. Like, you know, it's it's something that's been brewing for a while and you just finally have, you know, like... And like the opportunity him. for it. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but he probably was slightly opportunistic and he probably was like, huh, this is the boost that I needed to take this plan to the next level. Yeah. Because, I mean, seriously, like he he probably been doing it, like you said, for years. He's been stealing fossils. He's been doing this stuff. So I, it's hard for me to be like, well, you know, I just did it because I loved her. I'm like, no, you did it because you liked it and you got away with it for a long time and you figured you could get away with it at this level as well. Mm -hmm. But you didn't. Well, I think, you know, and I, I brought all that up in his childhood about like the whole growing up in a Mormon religion and all that. And I think a lot of people would feel bad for him because of what happened. And and I do. I You know, that's religious trauma. We can agree that that's really sad, blah, blah, blah. But he also he also understood the reaction in his community with his decisions. He understood stealing fossils from U of U, what could happen, you know, what the reaction could be. He knew stealing moon rocks in Mar you know, samples from Mars sure. 
you know, he knew what the he knew what it was going to be, but he did it like you said because he liked to do it. I think. Yeah. And like you were always saying, you're like, yeah, and just because we're not saying that just because you experience religious trauma that you're going to steal moon rocks. No. Like causation does not equate correlation. There are a lot of people who have religious trauma and they just get a job selling insurance and drive a minivan. You know, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. The other thing is that NASA's uh JSC co-op program has since added ethics education to training for incoming students. <laughs> Dude. Dude, it's like, seriously, it's like all these kids who are like, this is so dumb. Why do we have to do this? And I always tell kids, I'm like, it's because some jerk body, yeah. no, at some fad at some point, <laughs> Some bad dad. Some bad dad. And now everybody for the next hundred years has to take this lame ethics course. Listen. Good job, Listen. You left a legacy, dude. You did a lot of things, but you did leave a legacy. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I I mean, I haven't left a legacy like that. I haven't had people take an ethics class because of my bad behavior. Yeah, but I think we should say that not all legacies are good legacies that's kind of what i mean i'm like you know i don't know what type of legacy you're going to leave but if it was just any old legacy i think you left one yeah bad last thing i'm gonna say since 2002 hundreds of students have participated in a program designed by a senior special agent joseph gunthians and it is a project to essentially recover missing moon rocks and other lost, stolen, destroyed items, right? The project has led to significant discoveries, including the missing Cypress Apollo 11 moon rock and the Cypress Apollo 17 Goodwill moon rock. So there's some really cool programs out there that are still scouring the black web, you know, keeping a pulse on these these kind of underground collector communities to try to recover try to recover all of these invaluable objects that might be what floating around or yeah running amok running amok yeah. and that is the nasa's moon rock heist man isn't that the wildest thing that there i mean what words what words are there for this i don't know hashtag bad bad if we, if I can find more stories like this, this is why I love nonviolent true crime because I think that it's fascinating. This stuff is just, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So that is the wild, wild case. Yeah. For today's episode. Yeah, I do have to say, like, good on that for kind of moving on, right? Like, good for him for being like, you know what? I'm moving on. I forgave myself. I don't know. I think that's like he's, I don't know what type of productivity he's into, but it sounds like he's still, you know, like he's being productive. He's doing TED Talks. He's, you know. I just want to point out, like we talked about in the Pam Bulick episode with Bob. Mm-hmm. Homeboy Thad literally did all of this for a piece of ass. Oh, yes. Stole yeah. moon rocks spent eight years in federal prison, lost his spot in a prestigious internship, lost his opportunity and his chances of becoming an astronaut literally for a a piece of ass. Yeah, but I'm not fully convinced that it was. I think he just wanted to do it. Same with Bob. Maybe. You know what I mean? I don't know, man. I think they just want to do it. That's just their, that's their excuse. Yeah. 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 It is temporary well, insanity. Temporary insanity. Well, per usual, you guys, thanks for hanging out with us through this wild and crazy thief of a ride. That's right. And we'll catch you on the wild side. Bye, guys. Later, Gators. Did you love that so much? I love it so much.
Hey Wildside Tribe, don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Wildside Podcast. Make sure to tune in on Wildside Wednesdays. New episodes will drop each Wednesday at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We would love to hear from you. So if you have a wild case recommendation, email us at wildsidepodcast at gmail.com. That's wildside with a C. As always, if you haven't heard it today, you're loved, you're worthy, and you're valuable. And we'll catch you on the flip side.